Got to record. So as I said, I'm Sean Tavelia. I am one of the founding uh, members of the board of the Hamptons Observatory. I'm also academic chair for physical science at Suffolk County Community College. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Hampton Observatory is a not-for-profit establishment. Uh, we were created in 2005. It doesn't seem that it was that long ago. Um, with a mission to provide family-friendly uh, science programming uh, for the general sciences, but mostly spe um, uh, specific to the astronomy. But over the years, we've really encompassed all sciences and bringing uh, that hope of bringing um, cutting edge science to the rest of the world, uh, not only to Long Island. Thank you for all of you who are joining us from areas outside of Long Island, including our executive director who's uh, signing in right now. Um, if you're, uh, if this by any chance sparks your interest in the sciences and you want to continue, I please ask you to, to check out uh, Suffolk County Community College if you want to get into meteorology or atmospheric sciences. We offer a number of online courses, including one on climate change, global climate change that you might be interested in. If you're a local and you live in New York, specifically on Long Island, we have campuses in Riverhead, uh, Selden, where I am, and in uh, Brentwood. So please check out our website. That's uh, sunysuffolk.edu. If you want to see more events uh, that we offer at Hamptons Observatory, I encourage you to please join us at hamptonsobservatory.org, uh, uh, where you can also donate if you feel uh, that this uh, satisfies your need to sciences and you want to see this continue, please uh, take a moment and join our website and uh, please provide a, a small donation. That'd be most wonderful. All money goes directly to these programs and making sure that the, the observatory can continue to offer the programming that we do. Uh, and this has been a wonderful uh, partnership between the observatory and the college. So we hope that we can continue this. Without further ado about me, uh, on to our presenter. Uh, Ramon Laramende is a polar explorer and inventor of the Inuit wind sled. During his 30 year career, Ramon has led more than 20 major polar expeditions and has made over 100 trips to the polar regions. One of his most renowned trips was the Circumpolar Expedition from 1990 to 1993, during which he traveled nearly 14,000 kilometers by dog sled from Greenland to Alaska across the Northwest Passage. And you can see that in National Geographic's global expedition in January 1995. Ramon specializes in the traditional Inuit travel and survival techniques. He has lived more than eight years in the Arctic and currently resides between Spain and Greenland. He is a decades long member of the Explorers Club in New York, as well as a co-founder and director of the Tasmara uh, South Greenland Expedition Agency. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to our speaker, Ramon Laramende. Okay, thank you very much. And yes, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And, and thank you really to you and to the Hampton Observatory for this opportunity to share my experiences in the, in the Arctic. And I'm gonna pass to the presentation to really get to the, to the, to the presentation. And we continue with my presentation. Okay, uh, you can see the presentation. Yes, Lord. It's everything is good, no? Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, I'm gonna talk about the, the, the Inuit windslet and the polar research. For, of course, first question is, what is the Inuit windslet? Uh, the Inuit windslet really is the first uh, sailing or wind power vehicle capable to, uh, to traverse the polar plateaus of Greenland and of Antarctica, really able to sail through the, through the ex extend the remote interiors of Antarctica. No? And this project started with a question that I asked to myself in 1999, already a long time ago. And it was, why is that? That is, why not to use the wind to navigate through the interior of Antarctica? Uh, that looks like an obvious question. The interior of Antarctica is a huge sea of ice of really thousands and millions of kilometers of square kilometers. And uh, yeah, it was an obvious question that was not really solved at the time I, I, I started uh, to make this question. No? Of course, that's, I was not the first one to, to ask this, uh, um, to think like that. There has been 
the first known picture of an attempt to use the wind in the interior of, of Antarctic of the polar regions, it has been in the surface of the polar region, of course, through the through the sea. Many people have navigated through the sea, but not through the polar plateaus to the land. It was Fritz Nansen in 1888. That's really the first picture, the first known picture of an more or less an attempt to use the, 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 the wind to use a cell to lighten the sled. And of course, Scott, this picture is from Scott. Scott in his expedition, they tried to use the, the wind to lighten the weight of the sled. And, and other people have really been trying to, to use the wind because of course, that's an obvious question. Uh, it's flat or reasonable flat and it's huge and there is wind most of the time, no? But uh, before really getting into the into the uh, into the Inuit Winslet, I would like to, to just make a very brief note about uh, this circumpolar expedition that you mentioned, because it's not possible really to understand the rest of the project without talking about this uh, circumpolar expedition that you can check in actually in as you say in January in National Geographic in January 1995. We made my companion Manuel Oliveira that actually is attending this lecturing and uh, and myself. We cross all the Arctic from Greenland to Alaska through 14,000 kilometers, living three years in the Arctic with the Inuit of the Arctic. We learn a lot of things. We learn the language. We learn a lot of skills about sleds, about survival, about hunting, about really everything. That was a, a really a real master's degree on, on survival and on traditional travel and survival techniques uh, from the Inuit. What well, is not really easy to learn and not really easy to experience. Of course, that was a huge experience. There are some pictures from that from that journey. Uh, we using the the dogs sled that we built and we trained the dogs and we and we, we use all the equipment. But especially these sleds that we really use and built uh, many of them in order to to uh, to succeed in this huge expedition of three years. And during those three years, we have a lot of conversation, a lot of talking, and there was a lot of a lot of sharing of, of, of information and, 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 and absorbing the traditional knowledge uh, of the Arctic. And that is really the base of this project of the of the Inuit Winslet. Because of course, uh, with this experience that trip took part in, in 1990 and 1993, the question was: if we want to sail through the ice. What will be the options to sail through the ice? How we, could we solve? The first uh, idea that comes to the mind is to really try to use the techniques of a sailing boat, of a sailing catamaran, of the high technology uh, from, from the sailing boats will be the, like the first, you know? and to put a sail or to put maybe a kite, but really in the construction of the sled, that's the first obvious uh, idea to use this kind of thinking. You know? but uh, with this huge experience and those 14,000 kilometers, I, I really thought that the traditional and extremely simple Inuit approach uh, to survival and to travel uh, and autonomous travel was a much better idea, even if it looked very, very, uh, it didn't look very sexy, we'll put it. No? And in the beginning, I was really trying to, to, to explore both options to, to solve it. and. Uh, finally, that's how we got to the conclusion, to the to the to the concept that it was much better to use the the Inuit approach for the sleds, and of course it came the the really the the base of the winter sled, uh, that is to adapt some ideas from the Inuit sled and to um, in order to create an articulated platform for navigating through the Antarctic plateau. You need an extremely articulated platform that is very flexible and that is capable of adapting to all the circumstances and that you can put on top of this of the, this platform that can be moved by a by a kite or by a sail of course kite is much better and in a platform that you are able to put a tent in order to create something similar to a sailing boat no and that this, this sailing boat will be a tent on top of a platform an articulated platform that is the most critical part that came through the Inuit, that's what I like to call it, Windersled or Inuit Windersled, related to the concept, and then the, the, the kite. You know? And of course, that was a very rough, very rough ideas. 
and that's how we started in the in year 2000 from year 2000 to 2003 to make several attempts to cross greenland to really see if this strange concept could really work no and we succeed to make some uh, some traverses of more than 5000 kilometers really seeing that the potential of this combination of a of a articulated platform wooden articulated platform with a tent on top and moved by kites really could work and after those expedition came the real big challenge in 2005 that was to be able to prove if it was possible by the very first time nobody has tried and done before that before this expedition uh, to really be able to cross Antarctica sailing across Antarctica not skiing not going to other places just full sailing all of Antarctica more than 4,000 kilometers and uh, with a very basic wind sled, no, and and of course that was the, this has been the most challenging uh, expedition of the of the wind sled that we succeed to make more than four thousand kilometers, four thousand five hundred almost, sailing across the interior of Antarctica by the very first time, no, and and that that was really the demonstration that it really got potential as a as a vehicle up to that stage. Uh, uh, the idea was a pure exploration. We were just thinking in really how to move they something to do something for exploration. But in this expedition, we met some people from the uh, the Grenoble uh, Glaciology Institute from Grenoble that they really gave us the idea. They they saw the sled and they gave us the idea of the potential and they asked us the question if we have thought about the potential that this concept could have for light scientific exploration in Antarctica. Because they say that, of course, it was incredibly complicated to 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 cross the interior of Antarctica by any system. They were telling us a story that they wanted to do a transect, a traverse, and they have been almost twenty years to plan it to do it by motorized vehicles. And after this meeting with the Grenoble Institute, it came the idea of the next step in this project in the in the wind sled to really see if it was possible to use it for science, not only for exploration. No? And then it starts. The second part of the, the stage that would be uh, the with the expedition uh, wind power Antarctica, Xiona wind power Antarctica, where we, in order to be able to have a scientific team and we have to have a much bigger sled, be able to carry more people on board and have much more weight. Of course, in exploration, you try to be as light as possible, but for us, the point was opposite how to be as heavy as possible. And, and then started this part. You can see in this concept, we have put the, the sled in two parts and, and we have put this tent on top. And with that, uh, with this uh, modified, slightly modified concept, we were able to uh, go to the South Pole and cross Antarctica in another road, make the second crossing of Antarctica with uh, the wind sled. In this time, we were four people that we were sailing over the sled and actually it came the first scientist over over this sled you know here we arrived to the to the to the south pole and i will uh, let's see if i can if it's possible uh, mm, no it's not possible yeah here this is a, a picture of the of the of of this sled you can see how really it is. It's a very good picture. You see the the, the front sled, and then you see the the, the tent that goes behind, you no? Know? And uh, and after this uh, success, we have already done six major expeditions: four in the Arctic, two in Antarctica, and uh, we really have proved that it was possible. It's possible to navigate. It's possible to sail. And it came the challenge of making it bigger in order to have more people on board more payload more weight in this uh, following those ideas we make uh, here is manolo Oliveira that is attending actually this lecture is is, is having some scientific uh, is doing some some scientific work and we start to do some really scientific work in the in the sled and we got three sleds three different sleds that go like in a convoy and we introduce this this uh, this first sled that is the piloting cabin is a place for the pilots and to work. Then we have the, the, the cargo sled and then we have the living module of sled. No, 
and we, we managed to do the the first Greenland circumnavigation with the with the wind sled, no, and we continue uh, developing in this this is picture of the following expedition and in 2016 actually where we really were looking for different challenges and we wanted to go to the summit of greenland and go to the summit station and we make a, a, a special triangle going to summit that is an area with very little wind and, um, and difficult conditions from the wind and doing like a more a more complex road no? and everything worked properly until in 2016 uh, we make the first scientific expedition or with a lot of science expedition in, in Greenland, actually Ross Edward, a scientist, an Australian-American scientist came on board. He was the second scientist really came in on, 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 board, the, on board the sled. And uh, here you have a picture of how is the sled. You, you can see that it's much bigger. We have the, the, yellow, the yellow tent is an sled with a living module. Then we have the second sled starting from the right. This is a cargo sled. Then we have the, the third sled, the white one. There were boxes for collecting samples. And that was the, the, the scientific sled there. And then we got the first sled that is a piloting cabin where the, the piloting team uh, were working. No? Because in the wind sled, uh, and in this expedition, we were six people on board the sled. We were six people and more than 2,000 kilos. No? The idea of those two tents is because the wind sled is a sailing boat for the ice. It means that, uh, that we are sailing day and night, not only during the day. That there are two teams of people, of three people. One is sleeping while we go, and the other team is working. Uh, working means that you can be sailing, you can be navigating, or that you can be uh, working or doing the scientific work. It's roughly like nine and a half hours of work of one three people team and the others are resting and opposite. On this way, we can really take advantage of almost 18, 19 hours per day for really work and for being uh, on the move. And that's that's a lot of time you know, that is uh, that that you can have for that. And then in this expedition, uh, in this expedition, uh, yeah, we went. The next one was to the Ice River. In this Ice River expedition, and we went to the Egrip. That's the the scientific station. Egrip, where they are doing uh, deep coring in in the Greenland ice cap. No, and uh, of course, after all, I have been very very fast going through almost seventeen years of work, and after from the very basic concept, we finished having the idea of how really is the wind sled. And here you can really see the wind sled is a is a, this uh, this this sled that is made up of four different sleds that go in a convoy and then can have six people on board, can have a lot of cargo in the two different sleds, and that is propelled by giant kites that go up to 350 meters away from the sled. They go very, very far away and have a huge power. No? And the, the total weight of the sled with the people on board is between 2,000, 2,200, up to 2,500 uh, kilos. No? All the sled is, uh, is, you can see, uh, is uh, based on the, on, the, on the Inuit sled. It means that it's tied by ropes and that can be folded. No? It means that for transportation and for anything, the full sled you really can put into very into very few boxes. It can really it take very few, uh, very little space in order to store the sled. It's very it's very it's very extremely simple. It's extremely light. It's extremely easy to transport, and and with a with a minimum weight and a minimum and a minimum space needed for that. Huh? But once it's deployed over the ice. It really has a potential, as we have demonstrated through the other expeditions, to cover really thousands of kilometers through Greenland uh, and through the interior of and through the interior of Antarctica. And the, the concept it, in this 2017 expedition was fully, fully um, clear, no? because it's not very intuitive concept uh, to to see. And of course, these four sleds can be can can be uh, put it in two different sleds in a way that people can be sailing in two different teams 
in a way that we already did in 2016, that one expedition team went through to an area and another separated 100 kilometers and then later we met in, an, in a coordinates, in certain coordinates. So it has this really flexibility of, of being able to, to be moved and transported. And the basic concept, that's also an, the Inuit concept, is that everything is extremely simple. The simplicity is totally huge. It means that the possibility that the sled break is very little. In the first expedition, you saw uh, that the sled was very just like some woods over the ground that were broken. Actually, in the first crossing of Antarctica, we broke very badly all the runners of the sled and all the crossbars because the conditions were really tough, extremely tough. Sastrugis are were huge, and the conditions were much more difficult than we would we have expected. Therefore, uh, the basic idea is that the sled is so, so simple that you really can repair. Whatever it breaks, you can fix it, uh, whatever. In the sled, even if all the pieces of the sled break, you could fix all of them and continue. Of course, it will not happen. It almost happened in the first crossing of Antarctica. But thanks to that concept of simplicity and, and, and reliability and capability of, of fixing on the, on the, on the, on the ice, we were able to succeed in this first major uh, crossing of Antarctica of 4,500 kilometers through one of the toughest area of the Antarctic continent. And the, the concept is fully developed uh, for this 2017 expedition. And then once we have reached that, uh, through the Spanish Polar Committee, uh, we were able to, to were invited to make a presentation about the potential of the of the Winslet actually in the COMNAP International Meeting, the COMNAP Committee for National Antarctic Programs, a governmental uh, meeting of all the of all the polar Antarctic program Antarctic programs, and we were able to, to really present the concept and, and have some feedback for the different uh, different uh, programs. Of course, we we're presenting the potential of uh, for light scientific exploration in the interior of Antarctica. No? And some of the slides are actually I did put in this in this presentation that was very, very surprisingly received because that's a completely striking different concept. Not, not really, it's, uh, it's like totally different to anything. Of course, uh, everybody thinks in full technology when we think in some innovation has to be full technology. But the concept here is that the technology, you want the technology for the cargo in the interior of the sled, but for the frame of the sled, you want it with simplicity because it will, uh, you will have much less headaches uh, with this, this basic simplicity for moving. And with this lightness, of course, you can, you can try to get inside as much, as much technology and as much uh, sophistication, no? but not for the framing. No? Uh, and, and and of course there are five five clear five clear um, uh, reasons why the sled is, uh, is 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 has a lot of advantages. Of course, uh, first is of course ecology. I mean, it's impossible to be more ecological than this sled. Physically, it's materially impossible. Just absolutely the minimum capable of uh, the minimum impact possible no impact really and then is the logistic simplicity that is also very important because uh, you have to transport your sled to antarctica and then of course the minimum space it means the minimum of resources in order to get it to antarctica to get it out of antarctica to get it on the ice to get it out of the ice it really simplifies everything to the to the limit really no and not also also important is the economy is so extremely simple that, of course, uh, in economic value is very little economic value. What what costs really to build one uh, one sled, no? And 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 of course, it's very reliable. What I meant that a full sled is created with this Inuit mentality. An Inuit hunter that is on the ice, uh, if he break his sled, his equipment, he cannot phone anyone to help him. And that's the same concept for the important things for survival. We want to be in with. It means that we are reliable on ourselves only, and anything that breaks, we really can fix it. That's what I meant. That the, the concept that for the baseman, we want simplicity and the technology for the work that we do with this with this tool that is the window sled. No, uh, 
And of course, this versatility, you, know, you can use two sleds, you could even separate in three different sleds and go to a point, go to another. You can, on the ice, create a new type of sled. I mean, you really uh, can do a lot of things with this sled. It's not a fixed uh, concept and really can adapt to every, any project that you are, that you are doing. No? And of course, there is the question, uh, what are the other options to explore the interior of Antarctica? Of course, in this presentation is Professor Paul Majewski, that he has absolutely a, extremely huge experience in exploration of the interior of Antarctica, and he knows all the complexities and he knows absolutely everything about that. But actually, the point is, what are the other options to go there no? and, and to really do some sampling? There are really four options to really go there. Of course, there's one is with a convoy, with a rat track convoy, uh, transporting everything. There is another point that is to go with a twin otter, with a plane, with a skid. You go to a location and then you are doing your work and you are picked up with this location that you go to a specific point. Now there are these Toyota's car that actually will be likely the most efficient system, I, I believe, the most efficient motorized uh, system. Um, and then will you have by snowmobile also that, that that will be this is really the four different options no? and uh, or normally it's snowmobile of course you will need fuel for those for those other approaches you would normally will need resupply of fuel because it takes for a long traverse for a short area of course is they are superior the snowmobiles and the and the cars uh, for a long traverse of Antarctica you would have this problem of, of resupply and, and fuel, yeah? And but the, the one and the, the wind sled, uh, the superior part of the wind sled capabilities for real long traverses of Antarctica. As longer the distance, uh, you really get the best of the wind sled for 3,000 kilometers, 4,000 kilometers, huge traverses that are incredibly complex to, to do in any other system no? because of this resupplying thing. And of course, but the most similar for a big traverse will be a, a, a convoy, an Antarctic convoy with the rat tracks. That of course is a huge project to make a, a traverse, a transit of Antarctica with this with these convoys, uh, logistically, and not less uh, with the, the fuel you are really using. Of course, every rat track that is having a, a heavy cargo can spend several liters of fuel per kilometer. And of course, in a big traverse will be minimum three, four, big uh, tractors and, and really will be a huge problem. No, There was an interesting expedition in 2007, Norwegian-American expedition in the interior of Antarctica, uh, scientific traverse, and we really were just checking some of the of the of, of their organization. No? And you could see that, of course, big part of the of the weight that, that they have to transport is for the fuel, really for this huge consumption of fuel. And uh, but at the end is you have a sleeping module, you have a living module, you have a workshop, uh, and you have a cargo, uh, a cargo sled. Basically, that's the concept. And then you have, of course, all the fuel and the sleds and and, and this equipment, no? and of course the spare parts for the for the for the tractors and for everything. No, here we have with the wind sled we got the same, but of course simplified, much more simplified in every part of it. No. And of course, from the project that are that can be done, there are many different projects that are interested in Terra Antarctica. Of course, there are some heavy projects that, of course, Winslet is totally out, has nothing to, to do with the project where you really need a, a very heavy equipment, because of course it's impossible. There are physical limitations with the Winslet that I will explain a little bit more. But there are but of course, but there are some things that of course is not possible to do, but there are many other things that actually it is possible to do because they are in the in the in the weight and volume range that could potentially be transported with the wind sled in order to be used for a scientific sampling exploration in the interior of Antarctica. No? And the other question is, what is the optimal area of Antarctica that can be used with the wind sled? And of course, East Antarctica is the, the really optimal area. West Antarctica could be used, but I think it's not really so optimal. Because they say there are much more relief in West Antarctica. Um, for what I really have studied, much more crevasses in West Antarctica, and the patterns of the wind are not so clean. And and really, East Antarctica is the ideal part, and also is one of the parts that is less explored. 
because of the remoteness. No? It's, here is the inaccessibility South Pole that actually we went in 2005 to the inaccessibility the South Pole. Actually, we were the first modern expedition uh, after the expeditions of the Russians and Americans since the 60s. Uh, and actually, it was a, a question that we got to the, to the real modern coordinates because the, the Russian coordinates uh, with the modern satellite measurements is uh, some 150 kilometers from the from the um, Soviet coordinates and in that way we really were able to reach the the first to reach these modern coordinates of the inaccessibility support but that's just a small detail important is that this area of of East Antarctica is optimal because it's very high it's flat there are extremely few crevasses there are some crevasses but there are extremely few crevasses and embedded located points and uh, and it's huge. We need long distance to get the best out of the wind. Like we need thousands of kilometers because that's where you really can 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 have this point of of covering a huge distance without resupplying in totally autonomy uh, for that. No? And there is a pattern of winds in western in East Antarctica that is you can go, you can come back. There is a very pattern of of of, of wind. No? And of course, the point is that the winds let it allow for a new type of, of, of scientific exploration that is uh, light uh, and zero emissions. That's, of course, extremely important. No? After all those projects, we came with the last uh, Antarctic expedition that we, what we, we took in 2018-19. We wanted to do uh, the two previous Antarctic expeditions. The first has been pure exploration. The second has been a little development, but it still was very, very early development of the, of the sled. I wanted to do a, a more heavy science expedition, really trying to get many samples on board, so many projects on board, and to really see uh, if we were able to manage to make those projects. Of course, they were not extremely complex projects, but they were uh, demanding projects. And uh, we that was, we planned it. Manolo Oliveira, he was also in this, and um, Ignacio Fitzaldegui, and Ilo Moreno were the team made up of four people that we wanted not really to make a long crossing, but we wanted to go to Don Fuji, to get up to Don Fuji, and uh, because it was a challenge to really go to the area with less wind in Antarctica. We already knew know pretty well the patterns of the wind, what we can expect, but the challenge was to really go to the areas with less wind and worse wind conditions uh, and come and go to the same location, what is not really extremely simple it has also done some technical complexities no and and those were they we wanted to establish what would be like the winter base camp the, the optimal place location for starting expeditions from the uh, uh, queen mouth land in antarctica in the south african sector and uh, and we wanted that was our challenge no that was really a, a technical challenge because that was the first the first uh, time that we have like a science module, we have three modules, we're carrying 2000 kilos to Antarctica. As I mentioned before, the conditions in the interior of Greenland are much easier than the conditions of the interior of Antarctica. It's a huge difference. This is true, we are very tough, are very hard as snow, and it's much more difficult uh, to, to, to sail in Antarctica. No? The conditions are much more difficult. And then it was the first time we were having this already pretty long sled, almost a 12 meter long sled and 2000 kilos and we were four people on board and yeah and we're testing new kites we needed to 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 get the kites up to to 150 square meters in order to have much more power no? and we took 10 different projects some extremely simple others a little bit more demanding and uh, in order to to yeah to carry out this work while we were traveling no? uh, as we were going and coming back for the way in, the wind conditions were pretty difficult, but we managed to really get to the to the to the point uh, we were aiming, and uh, the return was easier. You can see some pictures of this last expedition, 2019, uh, of the sled. This is the piloting cabin where we are working and we are piloting the sled on and having all the science while the other rest of the team is really sleeping or resting in the in the living module. No? And you can see a lot more pictures of how did it look in 2018-19 in this uh, crossing we made from Antarctica. Here is also Manuel in a very cold day. Actually, 
and that we were really sailing. You can see that the sailing is you are sitting on the sled and are moving the, the, the kite. It's pretty simple. It's not really very difficult to, to maneuver the sled. It's just to get in the, the kite up. So there are some techniques. It's not too easy. It's not too difficult. And you can see a view from the, from the, from the air. No? And here you see the, the distance. As I mentioned, it's very important that the distance from the kite is almost 350 kilometers. That's extremely important to be so long because it is much easier to, to maneuver and to drive the sled. Um, and it's very difficult to have both of them together in a picture. Actually, in this picture, we have the, the kite is at a lower distance. It's not 350 meters. It's like 100 meters. No? We put closer in order to make the picture because it's almost impossible to make a picture that you have both parts. No? The kite can be up to 200 meters high on the ground, what is very important because sometimes there are very much wind up and other times it's wind in the middle, 100 meters from the ground. And sometimes there is even a small variations on the distance of the wind. And in a very exceptional cases, we can have total calm in the surface and have, can have pretty a strong wind up there no? and even different, dis different directions. No? It's a full war, the uh, utilization of the wind at another height. And another at 100, 200 meters from the ground. No? It opened a lot of, a lot of uh, possibilities. No? Really, we used to say that what is happening on the ground is just irrelevant. It's almost irrelevant for the, for the wind sled. No? And, uh, and we have to have some of the projects that we're having, we're making some calibration from Galileo, the European Space Agency. We're working also with the uh, air collecting from the micro air polar project. And we are testing uh, some sensors that we're using in the in the March 2020, and we're working with Professor Majewski, that is here attending this lecture. With testing, of course, the, how we could do some shallow coring, uh, and and and, and we're doing some of that uh, that coring, no, uh, for the first time in Antarctica. And here there are some of the samples, and we have another project, another six different projects that we're carrying out, no, and. Uh, and that was what the, our achievement, the first really science project in the interior of Antarctica. No? After this project, we came to back to, to Spain, where we are a Spanish citizen. And myself, I'm living in Greenland, and actually Greenland, Iceland, and Spain. I'm living in the three countries. Right now, I'm, I'm talking to you from, from Reykjavik, Iceland. And we're received by the Minister of Science and, and Innovation in Spain. And of course, we're just uh, exploring the possibility uh, to be uh, that the that the wind sled could be used as a scientific infrastructure uh, for Antarctic research, you know, to, besides other infrastructure that are for Antarctic research, can be an Antarctic base or a boat. That why not? That's a system that you can really can cover thousands of kilometers in the interior of Antarctica, you know? and we're really able to, to put officially to have a this official discussion about the potentiality of of, of introducing this this concept for the uh, governmental uh, exploration, navigation, and, and, and research. No? After this trip, we made the first symposium of science and, 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 and the winter sled with the different scientific scientists that had been involved, including uh, Professor Majewski, and others uh, were attending and really giving their points of view about the potential of the, of the utility the, that, could, uh, that could have. No? Um, of course, not all the scientists are working in the interior of Antarctica, but it was broadly uh, agreed that, that it has a potential, it has a place, Winsland has a place in the scientific research, clean zero emission scientific research of the interior of Antarctica. No? One of the concepts that I was um, talking was about the, how good be a, a, an expedition, no? what will be the, 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 the conditions of a scientific expedition uh, of the interior of Antarctica uh, in uh, they are in an uh, Antarctica unexplored 2018-19 were four people and the sled the overall weight was 2,000 kilos but the really the, the the capabilities of the sled will be to transport have also four sleds not three sleds and have six people on board and uh, that has some autonomy up to 70-75 days in, in autonomy have everything all the food all the fuel that you are needed and a scientific cargo that can be from 350, a little conservative. And that's what we would like to do in the next expedition. We would like to have this weight, 2,000 
500, 600, my belief is that it can go up to 3,000 kilos, the overall capacity of the sled, but we really have to trust, test little by little, and um, therefore have almost 700 kilos of scientific payload on the on the sled, but still that has to be worked out. And the next project, we want to have this 300 kilos, 300, 350 kilos, and the total overall weight of the sled that the kites have to pull, because of course the kite is the most important part of the sled, uh, to be 2,600 kilos. No? And then after this, uh, after this symposium, we we're already planning the next challenge. And the next challenge was to do a circumnavigation of Antarctica, linking the main uh, Antarctic bases, South Pole, Vostok Station, Russian, the Concordia, uh, Kunlun Chinese Station, the Japanese Station, and come back to the same location. No? Because the wind is pretty optimal to go and come back. No? It's a very, very nice circulation of wind and pretty steady and pretty pretty good and actually this project was was approved it want to be done for the 2020 but of course uh, covid came and the project uh, collapsed uh, completely and therefore it was it was uh, yeah frozen on time the the project and uh, the next step that we did with the windsor was a, a, a small a little minor expedition in Greenland, in the south part of Greenland, we're testing the weight capacity because it's very important how much weight really the kites can pull for this to be sure that these 2,600 kilos can be really uh, transported. No, and that's why we did uh, this a smaller expedition in Greenland last year in 2022 uh, of continuing the technical development. There were a team of six people on board and make two, two different uh, projects. and. Uh, it was just a, the, the a special thing that happened in this expedition that we discovered a mountain, a noon attack, a mountain of, of rock in the middle of the ice. Of course, not in the middle, middle, but some 20, 25 kilometers from the closest land that is pretty long inside. And, and of course, that was a, a real sign of the climate change and how the ice is really decreasing, not only in the length, but in the altitude, in the, in the, in the, yeah, the, the altitude of the ice no, is really decreasing. And that was pretty shocking, actually, uh, to, to discover that place that was not in the maps, was not, not in any, any other place. No? But um, after that, of course, the, for Antarctica, um, I have been talking about the past and about the winter. I want to finish really talking about, the, about what are the, the, the future projects of the winter. What is the we have already been working for 23 years with this project because, of course, it's very complex to try. It's not obvious. An expedition is extremely complex to, to, to prepare and to carry out. It's really very difficult. And it has needed so long time to be little by little going from one concept to the other, improving the capabilities and testing new things, but, of course, not testing too many new things in one expedition in order of not really fail because it's too expensive and too difficult to prepare one single expedition, but start the, the, the concept, where are we going? This Antarctic circumnavigation, we were really confirmed to go in 2020, uh, is, of course, the next challenge for the, for the wind sled. And, but uh, opposite to the 2020, uh, the concept now is to make it in two years, in two different years, not really making one, because it's so demanding, it will be 7,500 kilometers to cover in a single year. I believe it's possible, but if we really are doing some heavy or relevant scientific projects, it will be too really too difficult to make both things. If we want to do come and go, we'll have to be just really full focus on being able to cover this enormous distance of 7,500 kilometers in total autonomy. No? But we'll put the focus in, in to really make properly the work and have the capability of having 2,600 kilos, six people on board, and, and this technical development, no? and, and, and do a proper uh, work. Of course, we are expecting, this project has been presented to the, to the Spanish Program, Program and authorities, and we are expecting that it's going to be fully approved and fully and financed, um, but we're still in the process. We don't know exactly what's, what is, uh, what is going to happen. And we'd like that. And of course, we cannot put a timing. We, we believe it will happen this year in November 2024. Uh, and we'll go in the way in to from Novo Area to South Pole, Vostok, and Concordia. And then we'll live with the with the Italian program or the French Italian program from Concordia. 
but that's just an if and and but this is the next step no the idea is that once we arrive to concordia we, we can leave all the sled in antarctica we can dig it on the snow and and leave it there for for the winter it will be no problem and of course we avoid to to send in other place if there is something broken of course we'll bring it new the next year but we'll leave it there and and come back the next year it will this logistic simplification we will we'll have just to get ourselves a little bit of equipment and of course the science uh, part no out of out of concordia the rest can stay there completely and fully and the idea will be the following year uh, that hopefully will be 25 uh, to make the the return trip going to the dom argus and the the chinese station and the dom fuji station and coming to the same uh, to the same point you know? that will be like the phase three for the planet for antarctica that yeah i say and that will be a little shorter expedition 3500 kilometers and together will be this huge 7500 kilometers distance and of course our phase four will be to try to solve to resupply this winded base camp it means the place where we will put the sled uh, well, we will dig the sled on the snow on the on the on the South African side uh, to try to 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 reach this place with electric uh, of some some other zero emission system, not with the wind sled, maybe with with electric solar electric that we are working at the same time, you know, and to solve this logistic part uh, for really making a full or or of course never is totally zero emission anything we know that, but of course as close. Uh, as we can in the in the overall project to really be in a, a full a full zero emission uh, expedition and that will be the the the, the last the latest uh, part of the antarctic mm, challenges ahead uh, of course in this project we are open to cooperation we are already of course talking with professor majewski about the possibilities that from her institute take part in the expedition and and, and we would love to to really cooperate with him and we're open to, to possible cooperations or any other cooperation and and this will be the and of course the idea will be somehow to repeat this expedition not maybe every year but maybe two years maybe be doing project like that no just would like to be into the into the governmental frame and and introduce this this project but of course once we have finished that we'll see what is the is too far to to think what will happen later but for sure if 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 it happened, it will be coming. Winds will be introduced for the really scientific research of Antarctica. And the, the very very last, before finishing my presentation for the Arctic, there are also major plans, uh, and that's more confirmed for 2024. We want to make a, a partial South North expedition, where we are also open to cooperation with with uh, with students or, or of researchers to to actually to take part in this expedition, and. Uh, Will go to this to this area, no, and in the in the Greenland in 2024, and in 2025 the idea is to make a North Greenland circumnavigation, reaching almost the the Peary Land, the northernmost part of the Greenland ice cap, and return to the same place in the in the west coast. No, and these are the the two the two ma major projects of Greenland. This year we're in preparation. Actually, I'm going to Greenland in a few days, and we'll be preparing some some stuff and having all the equipment fit. Uh, also for Antarctica and for Greenland, no? and yeah, and I think that that's that's enough. And now, of course, I would like to to just if any of you has any question, I will I will be very happy to answer myself or or yeah, uh, or my, even my companion that is in the presentation, Manuel Oliveira. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ramon. That was wonderful. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, before we get to them, I was wondering. Um, what brought you to the Arctic in the first place? Yeah, that's uh, actually a good question because I'm an unlikely uh, Antarctic uh, um, explorer. Yeah, I'm born in Madrid, Spain, and yeah, I just got always fascinated by the by the Arctic and by the by the by the emptiness of the polar regions. And, and yeah, and actually, I with 19 years old I came to Iceland where I live right now. Um, was my first contact with the with the Arctic, and, and in with twenty years already thirty six years ago, I participated in the first as an explorer adventurer in the first Spanish crossing of the Greenland ice cap by skis, and that was a really my my yeah. I I already was like in love with the Arctic, but after this expedition, I really got totally uh, yeah a little my life 
get in contact with the Arctic. And after that, I, I, I met people in Greenland that they invite me, I went to community and I really got into the, into the very remote and difficult and, and special uh, Arctic world, no? and special Greenland world. No? And, and then that's how it came the idea after I've been invited to a community in the, in the I spending one winter in a small community, it came the idea of making a real long traverse through the Arctic and through these circumpolar expeditions. No? And of course, once really made the circumpolar expedition, that I was my life was totally linked to the Arctic forever after that one. Nice. So you have a couple of technical questions in the chat, uh, a few from Yamanda. Um, what was the longest without wind? And then a follow up to that is, uh, he's asking if you could find winds of different directions if you change the altitude of the kite. Yeah, so actually the longest without wind, uh, it has not been so much actually. It has been four days. Four days is the maximum totally just, uh, well, no. Actually there was one in the very first expedition uh, to climb up, up to the ice, one time we got 10 days because it was an area that we didn't know exactly that was so bad. We have not, we're not so experienced to really know that that was not the correct place to go. And then we were 10 days, but it was just in the, in the very first expedition. After, in the middle of, of the plateaus, we have had only four days. And I would say that normally two, three days will be. And, and but we already count in, in, we know that we are going to have some periods uh, without wind. And of course, for the planning of an expedition, there are not all the areas are the same. There are some areas that we know that we are going to have difficulties. And like we call my, my partner, Ignacio Fidel, they create a little the, the words like highways and secondary roads. We call secondary roads the area that the wind is from Sikomsa is not very good. And we know it's going to have problems. And then, and then there are the real highways that is in a highway. I would think that it will be exceptional more than two days without wind. And clearly, Yolanda is a better packer than I am. Um, the second question is, how many sewing machines do you carry? <laughs> how many? How many sewing machines? Uh, we have one. <laughs> well, every, everyone got a sewing machine. We are for people <laughs> who have for, for sewing machine. Of course, we want, to, we want to carry a sewing machine. We have not carried so, so far because, of course, the key is that the guys don't break. That's what really is the most important at all. And... Uh, and and of course we have they have broken of course we have had many different problems and we are continuing because that's the most critical part is the proper kites that they fly very good and that they are extremely strong no extremely but of course the 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 tensions are huge you have to imagine 2500 kilos in an area uh, is never flat completely Some, sometimes it's a little maybe five degrees seven degrees can be soft as snow and you can be in a sastrugi uh, the tensions can be huge to really start from a stop to movement, from from not moving to moving. That's a huge, huge pressure that is in there the in under the the kites. No? And we are working on that. Actually, our uh, the the builder of the kites is coming to Greenland now in a few weeks to really testing, and we're going to be showing and improving this technique that is likely the most critical part of the expedition because the sled is like no problem. Whatever happened, we will fix it uh, easily, no? Uh, Manuel, I uh, would like to know if there's a, a range of, what the range of wind directions that the sled can can handle. Yeah. The range is actually uh, as much as 90 degrees from the wind, each side. Of course, the, the closer to 90 degrees is much more difficult. And it's easier to, to, to go 90 degrees with a not, extremely heavy sled. The heavier the sled, the more difficult it is to reach the 90 degrees. Actually with 2,000, 2,600 kilos, we are not really almost reaching 90 degrees because the tensions, you have to think that, of course, the kite, I don't know how familiar you are with the kite. The kite, there is a position of full force. There is an area where we call the window that you have less force for the kite. And then we put, uh, the technique is that we put the, the, the propulsion in a side of the sled. And then the tensions are just unbelievable, huge, in order to go 90 degrees. That's unbelievable force. Of course, if you increase the weight, yeah, the tensions exponentially uh, increase and then start to be too much. Or, or at least for us, 
is we have not really we really don't dare to go with 2500 kilos at 90 degrees but with the first sled up to, to 1500 kilos absolutely we can go to 90 degrees uh manuel has a, a follow-up to that which is um could you possibly explain the regular wind patterns uh that you experience in antarctica and greenland so uh, how do you decide to make those take those routes yeah actually the circulation is very it's quite simple so the, the general the pattern of circulation no? of course is regularly normal is this catabatic wind it means the wind really flows with the with the elevation with the control lines and is moved by the by the coriolis force roughly some 20 30 35 degrees no and of course that's like a general pattern it's a model but actually it's pretty real it's surprisingly of course it's not 100 percent i would say even not 80 percent but but this is pretty i mean you really can rely for making a, a project with this circulation no mm -hmm. and then and yeah it, it really it really works of course when you are close to the coast you have to be you have to study much better if there are mountains or there are other things to really study much better the, the conditions but in the in the overall that's the you really can plan for antarctica that's the way we can there is the central plateau of east antarctica the central summit of east antarctica and then you can go in the in the in one direction and you can you can go through one side of the dome of the dome argus and the and the and the, the tops of the interior and you come back through the other tops of the through the other side of the of the top of course you cannot see it where is the top because it's so flat that you cannot see but but it really it really works it doesn't mean that you can have opposite wind you can do have but this is exceptional no and uh, and and of course it was especially difficult this trip that we make in don fuji because we have to go and come back that was especially especially challenging no? from the wind point of view so just sticking with the wind for a second, um, Troy would like to know uh, what are the average and maximum speeds that you can attain? So the, of course the speed is, uh, so the problem with the wind rate is not the speed, it's how to control the speed. It's totally opposite problem. I mean, you really have to, to control because you want to go under control, especially in Antarctica. In, in Greenland, it's very rare to find these giant sastrugis. There are, but we just have found them one time in a very specific location with a very special condition. In Antarctica, we already know pretty well where they are most of the time. Of course, not, not 100%, that not we know. But it means that if you have a giant sastrugi that can be easily up to one meter high, of course, you don't want to go very fast. That's clear. You want to go um, a, a, a speed of 8, 10 kilometers per hour. That will be the optimal. It means that you really have to adjust very much to go in the optimal with the optimal kite, because we cannot change the size of the kite. We have to get to the ground and change the kite. And of course, the wind is moving. It's not. It's actually very regular. That's one of the of the problems that you have to be changing kites quite often in order to go to this optimal speed. That I will say eight ten kilometers per hour for Antarctica, and in Greenland, as it's more flat, I would say that the optimal 13, 15 kilometers will be the. Of course, we. Our maximum speed has been 56 kilometer per hour that we have go in Greenland. And we have done up to 428 kilometers in a single day in Greenland. We have done other several days of more than 400 kilometers and, and more than 300. In Antarctica, our record will be 311 kilometers in a day. But of course, that's a very specific, special, exceptional conditions. No? The, what we like to do in a day, 100 kilometers a day, that will be 100. 120, 130, 40, up to 150. That would be an extraordinary, an extraordinary day. But the key is to control the wind. That you are really controlling, not going too fast. Because if you hit a sastrugi, you have to have some capability of, of maneuvering and avoiding most of the sastrugis. There are always some sastrugi that you are. It's totally impossible to avoid. But you have to take it under control with the sled control and the sled will flex incredibly because it's it's completely. Yeah, it, it flex completely. That's the this Inuit concept is like superior for that because you really with composites, Kevlar, whatever concept, it's hard to think that you are gonna be able to have the 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 conditions no? or the and the capabilities of the of the Inuit basic uh, frame of the sled. Uh, Donna would like to know: uh, Is the wind sled ever used for tourism? 
No, actually, we have not used for tourism and uh, because we are in the project of exploration, really. So we have been opening every expedition has been a challenge in itself. So we're really in a, in a, in a challenge and will be, it's very going to be complex and we really want to, to focus into, into a special expedition with some scientific uh, part on it, no? with uh, having a totally official for Antarctica, I want that to be pure official. Because of course, the sled is simple, but the uh, capability, I mean, the, the know-how of the sled, that's the value is how to how to do it, really. You can receive the sled and really don't know, and it has to be taken with a, it's like few people qualified and you need a lot of experience and, and that's, and, and it's not gonna be a massive thing. And we'll have to be very, and um, yeah. And in Antarctica, we want to keep full on a governmental side. We would like to be, inside the, the, the it's a national project that's actually the next step we will not go other time if we are not into this national uh, totally governmental approach in greenland can be a little a little mixture but with science we are talking with some actually i'm, I'm having a meeting next week with the uh, niels bohr institute in 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 copenhagen and, and our, how we can put something you know um but but yeah, that's that's the use. Uh, myself, I work with tourism, and that's the reason why I want to do other things different than that. I have a lot of enough <laughs> with with the uh, working with tourism, and and, and really is is just like that. So, are there um, specific projects that the wind sled would be well suited for? Yeah, of course there are. So, uh, Paul Majewski could speak <laughs> actually could answer this question probably much better than than me uh, he will be the right person to 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 have him talking about about what he sees that is the most potential of course there is some shallow coring and one of the projects with the that is what uh, the, the Majewski projects and the climate change institute and the Niels Bohr institute for instance the Niels Bohr institute they are thinking in the shallow coring and analyzing of the samples on the sled because they have created a system to analyze the samples, not transporting the samples, but a full system of analyzing the samples. And, and then the, the, they want to have in, in all the projects to have like one person and, and be taking the course and, and analyzing there and keep all the data already there. And then you are saving transportation of samples. You are saving a huge uh, work. No? And that's a little the, one, one of the main projects. No? We are working with the collecting, the, of course, air collecting. But I believe that this will be the main project. Will be the really this shallow coring, and if it really it works, this this uh, this analyzing on the place that will be really 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 big, no. But it will be nice to to hear uh, Paul Majewski what he has to say about that. Hey, Paul, feel free to chime in. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Ramon. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, I've okay. known Ramon for a few years now, and I'm super impressed by uh, by what he has done and created. We've wanted to see something like this for a long, long time, being able to not only go these long distances, but zero carbon emissions. And, and as Ramon said, this is a tremendous opportunity uh, for research for uh, shallow coring, because we have very lightweight systems now uh, for surface sampling, for air sampling, which, uh, which is going on already, and for a whole series of tests. Small balloons can be launched to take air samples uh, to do uh, meteorological uh, measurements. Uh, it, it is very, very smart to be thinking as lightweight uh, and as efficient as Ramon is doing. I, my hat is off to Ramon. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. That's very nice to listen. So just a, a couple more questions in there. They're both related, so I'll put them out uh, the same way. Uh, Imanda wants to know if all your kites are NASA para wings, and then uh, Kay would like to know if there is a best width for the sleds and who manufactures the runners and the materials. Um, actually, we are, it's a little, we are um, not producing ourselves, but we are, uh, there is a, a, a a carpenter that we're working with us is really a little, uh, uh, yeah, customized. It's a really customized work that we have been developing and building. We are building them actually in, in Spain, these, these runners, because they are very special, because we have been testing them and training how they break, how we have been doing many different 
um, ways these uh, these sleds these these runners the, and this this crossbar to get the best out of it and we are now quite quite uh, uh, yeah we have quite clear but we we do ourselves will pull will be the we're not really we're not buying to any any factory or any anything like that no and we are continuously improving and of course the most critical will be the kites who build the kites because it's also very has to be really worked very properly and, and there is a factory here in actually also in Spain that is is really working is working with us and in the developing of the of the capabilities of the sailing and yeah and we're using this NASA para winds that because it's the for the wind sled is the best kite there are many kites it's a full world and world of kites but but the best capabilities is the NASA para wind yeah. well well thank you uh Ramon uh this was a fascinating talk thank you for everything you're doing to um you know, just to expand the sciences and doing it in a, a sustainable way in and in a, in a thoughtful way. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure for me and any of the people who has been listening is interested to contact, feel free to do it. Thank you. Uh, and if you're interested in our next talk, please take time to visit the Hantum, hantumsobservatory.org. I know Donna put a link in the chat. Um, and I look forward to seeing everybody soon. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity.